How many of you enjoy it very much when you know the answer, you know how to do something, and somebody is telling you how to do it? Anybody? How many of you enjoy that? Okay, I want you to think just for a moment. You know, we've been in this series. We've been talking about Jesus up close and personal. And today I want to talk with you about the unique relationship that Jesus had with his parents and the parents had with Jesus. How many of you have ever tried to tell your kid something and how to do something, but they already knew how to do it? Now, I want you to think of the unique challenge of being the earthly parents to God. Think about that unique challenge. And, you know, have you ever considered that? The unique relationship that Mary and Joseph would have with Jesus. God in the flesh. And Jesus would have with his mom and with his stepdad. You know, throughout the Bible, throughout the Gospels, a Mary of Mary appears many times throughout the Gospels. And even after the uh, resurrection and the ascension of Christ, Mary is there in the book of Acts. Now for Joseph, on the other hand, uh, after Jesus was 12 years old and they went to Jerusalem, you don't hear anything about Joseph after that. Scholars believe that he likely passed away, that he passed away. Now Mary, on the other hand, she was there a part of Jesus' life from the very beginning to the very end. She was there from the start to the finish. And I want us to talk about today and take a look at the way he related to his mom, to his stepdad, and see what we can learn from that. And we discover through their relationship that there really can be that relationship of mutual honor between parents and their kids and kids and their parents. How many of you would like a dose of honor in your relationships as a family? Amen? And you know, today's marriage, it's going to show us, the parents and the kids, how to honor one another, even beyond childhood. And relating with our parents, we can be like Jesus. Amen? And so let's talk a little bit about Jesus and his relationship with his parents. First off, he was teachable. Let me hear you all say teachable. Now, my buddy Tom, he used to tell the junior hires that he led, he would say, only the teachable are reachable. That's really true, isn't it? And I, you know, you know, when you read the Gospels, all of the words that Jesus said, they're in red, right? You read the Gospels and they're highlighted in, with red ink. But, you know, one, one thing you never hear Jesus saying was, I know, Mom. I know. (laughs) You never see those words highlighted there. And you know, when Jesus came into the world, just like all of us did, right? In fact, next month we're going to be singing uh, these words. Some of you are going to be singing this. The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Now that's pretty nice poetry, but quite frankly, it's not reality, right? Jesus was like all of us. He cried. He needed to be fed. He needed to have his diaper changed. And in fact, as a child, he had to be taught how to walk, how to talk, how to read, how to write. I got a question for you. Who do you think taught Jesus how to do those things? His parents did. And Jesus was teachable. He never said, listen, mom, do you know who you're talking to here? Okay. I got it. Even if he did get it. He was still teachable at that moment. And you know, and his parents, they tried to do everything right. The Bible tells us that on the eighth day that he was circumcised, they took him to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord, just like we do. Often we have these baby dedications. Jesus was dedicated to the Lord by his parents. And I like what it says in Luke. It says, uh, when Joseph and Mary had done everything. Let me hear you say everything. They'd done everything required by the law of the Lord. They returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. Now, if there was any child that, you know, could potentially be left to his own and still turn out all right, that would have been Jesus. 
But even the Son of God who came in the flesh was still nurtured and trained by his parents and pointed in the right direction. Now, how many of you would say if Jesus needed that kind of training and direction pointing by his parents, how much more us and our kids, right? That's a responsibility we have as parents. You know, they presented him at the temple. They observed the Passover. They knew that it was their responsibility to teach their son and get them pointed in a life of faith direction. You know, as, as parents, my wife and I, we assumed that responsibility. When my daughter, when my son came into, this, uh, into the world, we did not just hand them over to the public school system and assume that they were going to teach them everything they need to succeed in life, right? In fact, we didn't just hand them over to the kids' ministry director and assume that they were going to lay the solid foundation for our kids, we felt that as parents, that was our responsibility to help shore up a solid foundation for our children. That was the responsibility we had. And in fact, when it came to church, I mean, I, you know, I know where it's at. My kids got rebellious from time to time. I remember my daughter thinking, hey, I don't want to go to church today. And I said, I'll tell you what, you're still a minor and you're still in our home. And so guess what? When you're 18 and you're an adult, if you choose not to come, you, you have that right to make that decision. But when you're under our roof and mom and I are responsible for, this, for your spiritual direction in life, then as far as we're concerned, this is what we're going to do. It's just going to be a part of what we do. And you know what? Both my kids were very faithful in that. And there was a period where my daughter kind of went out here a little bit. But now she's in California. She's loving Jesus. And she's looking diligently for a home church for her to be a part in. And you already know about Joseph. He's plugged in right here. I'm telling you, that's part in due to the fact that we took a responsibility as parents to direct our kids in making that God connection. Amen? Now, I've always believed that, uh, you know, when kids are minors, they're, they're, there's a reason they're called minors. They're not at the place in their life where they really know what they should be doing or not be doing, right? And so when your 8-year-old kid comes and says, I don't want to go to church, they don't really know whether they should be there or not. And so that's where we as parents say, well, that's nice that you think that, but we're going to go. That's what we're going to do. I like what Proverbs says. It says, train up a child in the way that he should go. Would you read this with, with me, everybody? Train a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let's read that again. Train a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, so often it's easy for uh, parents to let just about everything get in the way. I mean, basketball games, Sunday morning, karate lessons, Sunday morning. There's, all, there's a myriad of things, and so often we, we pull our kids out of church because they got to go to karate. They got to do this. They got to do that. And then parents wonder, how come when their kid grows up, they just don't have that heart? When, when their foundation time was there to be laid, we were removing them from that opportunity. Am I making sense to anybody? And so we need to own the responsibility. Did you know parents have more influence on their kids than anybody? Did you know you have more influence on your children than their teacher, than their friends, even their pastor? More life influence comes from the relationship a young person has with their parent than with anybody else. Now, how many of you would say, wow, then there's a heavy responsibility we have and training up our kids in the way they should go, right? Amen? You know, when Jesus was uh, 12 years old, uh, now we don't hear anything about him between 12 and 30. But let me tell you something that happens when he was 12 years old. His parents...
family members, whole group of people. They traveled to Jerusalem. It was an annual deal that they would do. And while they were there, it came time to return home. And, of course, they're traveling in a big old caravan. And so two days into this thing, Mary and Joseph realized, hey, where's Jesus? They lost the Son of God. Okay, they left him in Jerusalem. And so two days into their journey, they go, where is, is he with you? Maybe he's with Aunt Betsy. They couldn't find Jesus anywhere. So they go, we better go back and look for him. And uh, they spent the next three days trying to track Jesus down. And you know where they found him? They found him in the temple. And when they were getting on his case, Jesus says, you, you must have known I would be about my father's business. You must have known I'd be about my father's business. And while he was in the temple, he's there with the teachers. He's learning from them. He's asking all kinds of questions. He was in the temple learning. He was in the temple learning. And in Luke, it says this. It says, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. You know what that verse shows us? It shows us the kind of culture that Mary and Joseph had fostered in their home. That Jesus, as a pre, as a tweener, as a preteen, would be that kind of young person that had that heart to learn, to ask questions, to grow. How many of you know he didn't arrive in the manger having all the answers? You understand that, right? He was the little Lord Jesus in the manger. And so it was Mary and Joseph that took the responsibility as a mom and dad to plant in Jesus' heart the kind of seeds that would grow and help him develop and move into the call, the mission for which he came. Look what it says in Luke. It says, then he went down to Nazareth and with them... Uh, and with that, and he was obedient to them. Let me hear you say that. He was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all of these things in her heart. And it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. What does that mean, everybody? He grew in wisdom and in stature. What's that mean? Okay. Okay. Stature could mean he grew physically. Okay. He was 12 years old, remember? And so they're returning, and it says, Mary treasured this in her heart, that her son was in the temple learning and asking questions, and she treasured this. And so the last thing we hear is this. He's 12. The next thing you hear, he's 30 years old. So what's happening in that interim time? He's growing. He's developing. He's growing in wisdom, and he's growing and in stature and in favor with God and with men. Now, we don't know. We don't know when the lights kind of came on to Jesus when he fully recognized who he was and the mission that he had on this earth. We don't know when that happened. But we do know this, that, that the in-between time, what he did is he was obedient to his parents. He asked questions. He was in the temple learning and growing and developing. Listen, can I just say something to you as parents? Will you do all you can to create and foster the kind of culture in your home where there's a foundation that's being laid, that you will do all you can to teach your kids everything that's good, that's right, that's pleasing to the Lord? You know, when you leave your kids to be educated by popular, secular culture, how many of you know they're going to have some pretty whacked ideas? How will your kids understand God's design for marriage except for you teach them God's design for marriage? That a husband and wife, they're not just meant to tolerate one another and get at each other's throat the moment one gets home from work. But even in the marriage relationship, there's honor, there's respect. Your kids learn that from you. They learn that from our relationships with one another. You want to plant the seeds in their childhood. Amen? Did you know statistically 80% of the people that give their life to Jesus do it before they're 18 years old? 80% before they're 18. 
How many of you in this room gave your heart to Christ before you were 18 or earlier? Raise them up high. Okay. Now, I don't know if that would be 80% of this congregation. This is kind of a unique environment because we have so many people coming to know Christ. But generally speaking, 80% do it before they're 18 years old. So as parents, we want to model the importance of a dynamic, vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's not just something you tell them to do. It's something they catch from you. How many of you know it's better caught than taught, right? They catch it from seeing it, seeing the importance of a life of faith being lived out in you. So Jesus was teachable. So if we're going to be like Jesus, what do we got to do, everybody? We got to be teachable. We don't want to be saying, yeah, 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 I already know that. We got to be willing to learn, you know. Sometimes there's more than one way to skin the proverbial cat, right? Sometimes somebody knows a better way to do something than you do. And we're so busy saying, yeah, 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 I already know. Talk to the left because you ain't right. (laughs) And we want to learn. Amen? Now, the other thing is this. The other thing about Christ. uh, I have. Okay, here we are. Is Jesus, he listened to his mom. How many of you have a hard time with that one? Now, a lot of you guys, you you know my mom was deaf, right? And so, uh, boy, I knew how to really push her buttons. (laughs) I just turned the other way, man. (laughs) Just turned the other way. I wasn't a good kid. But Jesus listened to his mom. Now, Mother's Day, I talked about this. The very first miracle that Jesus performed was what? You all know? He turned the water into wine at the marriage feast in Cana. Now, we don't know why they ran out of wine. Probably because they were drinking too much. But the bottom line is they're at a wedding feast. They run out of wine, which would have been a deeply humiliating situation for the wedding feast hosts. And now Mary turns to Jesus, and she tells him they've run out of wine. And so what does Jesus tell his mom? He says, hey, wh- why are you troubling me with this? My time has not come yet. It's not my time yet. What does he mean by that? What does he mean when he says my time has not come yet? Okay. What he's saying is I'm not, I'm not moving into my messianic role just yet. Why, why are you asking me to do something about this? I've not taught anybody yet. I've not performed any miracles yet. It's not my time yet. Now, did Mary use that as an opportunity to nag Jesus? Any parents really good at nagging their kids? Question for you, how's it work? Is it effective? Is it an effective parenting tool that if you just badger and nag at them enough, you're going to get the desired results? Doesn't work. So Mary did not nag Jesus. She just says, She comes to him and says, they've run out of wine. Jesus says, why are you troubling me with this now? My time has not come yet. And Mary just walks off and tells the servants, just do whatever he tells you. And can I, I could see Jesus just sitting there saying, I just told her my time has not come yet. Do whatever he tells you to do. And I I could just imagine Jesus saying, all right, all right. Why don't you just go fill up those, uh, those jars with, um, with water? And By the way, what's, what do they have at parties when there's alcohol present and it's been consumed? What's left behind? Empties, right? Does anybody find it fascinating that Jesus did not use the empties? He actually used the water jugs that were used for ceremonial washing. It was like Jesus was completely obliterating the religiosity that was at that party. He completely obliterated it. So he tells them to take the washing containers, fill those with water, and that was miraculously turned to wine. Now let me talk with you about that just for a moment. 
Because Mary at that moment was able to recognize something in her son that other people in the room hadn't recognized yet. And in fact, Jesus himself had not recognized at that moment. Because everybody in the room, they just thought Jesus was the carpenter. Yeah, Jesus is at the party. You know, that, that, the, the table in, you know, in my mom's living room, uh, Jesus made that. So they, they knew him as the carpenter. Now, Jesus saw past other people's impression of who Jesus was. And in fact, she saw past his own. He said, my time had not come yet. And yet God had used his mother to help him recognize, yes, in fact, your time has come. And the time is now. And parents, what a responsibility we have. Because so often the potential that lies within your kids, the prophetic assignment that they have created for them by God, nobody else sees it and they don't see it. But we have an opportunity to be just like Mary, where we get to speak into the lives of our kids and call forth the call of God, the destiny and the purposes of God that lie dormant in our kids. Amen? I think we need to give the Lord applause for that. The call of God is irrevocable. Let me just tell you something. Your kid may be off the deep end right now, but that destiny still lies there. Amen? That call still lies there. And so that's where you have a responsibility to cry out to God, God, move on the life of my kid. Don't give up fighting for them. Amen? And when you have the opportunity, you speak prophetically into their heart to call forth the very thing that humanity may not see, that they may not see, but God sees, and he's given you the ability to see who they can be when Jesus Christ gets a hold of their heart. Amen? Hallelujah. So Jesus listened to his parents. And then here's the last thing I want to talk with you about, is that Jesus looked after his mom. He looked after Mary. How easy, how easy is it to be distracted by our own pain and miss the plight of other people? I want you to think about Jesus being on a cross there for a moment. Jesus on a cross. He's arrested. He's abandoned by all of his followers except for John and, of course, his mom. He was beaten, mocked, humiliated, and hung on a Roman cross to die a painful death. Everybody had abandoned him except for his friend, his disciple, John, and his mother, Mary. I want you to think just for a moment that while on the cross, when your sin and mine, the sin of humanity was placed on Christ as the payment for the sin of the human race. As it was there, the Bible tells us even God, the Father, for a moment had to look away. But can I tell you who did not look away? Mary did not look away. Mary was there at the feet of Christ as he suffered, as he bled, and as he died on that cross. And John was there as well. And it says this, in that moment, how easy would it be for Jesus to be so focused and distracted on his own suffering that he'd missed what was going on right before him as his mom was in a place of brokenness about to lose her son. And his friend was about to lose his companion. And in John it says this, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby. He said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time on, that disciple took her into his own home. I want you to think about this. Before Jesus Christ breathed his last, and in this moment of suffering and anguish, he made sure his mom was going to be cared for. 
That's pretty powerful stuff right there. He made sure his mom was going to be cared for. You know, as we, grew, as we grow older, we kind of reach the point where the relationship's no longer about, gee, what can my parents do for me? Part of growing up is to say, how can I care for you? What can I do for you? You know, part of growing up is turning the focus from self to others, right? You know, and often when we're young, we take our parents for granted. That's because we're young. We don't know any better. But, you know, as you grow up, it's time to look after the ones that have looked after us. And so often we forget about that in the living years. You know, and then a mom or a father passes away, and then we're left with that guilt of saying, I should have loved them more. I should have been there more for them. You can't do that after they're gone. This is your time. They looked after you when you were young. Now it's time for you to look out for them as they grow older. Now listen, this isn't just a nice social idea. This is an example that Jesus gave us. When he was ready to part this earth, he made sure his mom would be cared for. That's a pretty powerful picture. Wouldn't you agree? That's a powerful picture. You know, when John was baptizing... And Jesus went down to be baptized at the Jordan River. It says this in Matthew, that the skies opened and there was a voice. And it said this, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Who said that? God was saying that about Jesus. Now at this point, when Jesus is being baptized, had he done anything Messiah-like? Nope. Had he preached any of his great sermons yet? Nope. Had he fed any crowds, any multitudes, or raised any dead people, or performed any miracles at that moment? Nope. So what had he done at that point? At that point, he was a good son. He was a hard worker. He worked in the carpenter shop. A good son, a good brother, a good hard worker. And can I just tell you, sometimes just doing the basic things is very pleasing to the Lord. I think sometimes we forget the importance of that. You know, when you live the kind of life that's honoring to your parents, that's honoring to others, God really likes that. He likes that stuff. I think we need to be like Jesus in that regard. Amen? Let's be like Jesus, that we never stop learning from the wisdom of those that have gone before you. How many of you know your parents have a little more mileage in life than you do? So chances are they probably have some life experience and wisdom you may not have yet. So let's not be so full of ourselves that we're unwilling to listen and learn from them. And even Jesus, who being God in the flesh, was willing to learn from his parents. Let's be teachable people. Let's be the kind of people that listen. And let's be the kind of people that say, hey, on my watch, I'm going to make sure my parents are looked out for. Amen? We don't have to leave that up to the social agencies. They're our parents. They're our responsibility. Amen? You know, when my mom was, uh, was you know, nearing the end of her life, one thing that really blessed me was how well my mom was looked out for by Rick right there. He owned the responsibility. He was there. He cared for her. He looked out for her. And when it came time for my mom to pass away, she wasn't alone. We were all right there with her, holding her hand. That's a tough, thing to, that's a tough place to be, but I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else. Amen? Love your parents while you have the opportunity to love them.